Ladies and gentlemen, if my fellow panelists are ready to uh, take their seats, I would like to, to start with this panel. We are a bit beyond scheme, but that's not due to uh, our panel, but due to the very interesting discussions with the uh, young people earlier this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, 1969, in a couple of hundred years, I think will happen to appear as a very important year in the history of mankind. Indeed, amongst others, because this year, the 29th of October, we will have the opportunity, at least, to celebrate the first successful attempt to send a message through what we could call now the predecessor of the World Wide Web. Indeed, the 29th of October in uh, 1969, somebody from the California University sent two letters, L and O, it was the beginning of login, sent that to a colleague at Stanford University. And that was, in fact, the first successful attempt of what afterwards would grow as Internet and the World Wide Web. Of course, we know that in 1990, in Geneva, at CERN, the real Internet, the World Wide Web, the protocol for it, for the use of it, was uh, invented. I think without exaggeration that we will agree that the disruptive characteristic of the massive use now of the Internet, we have currently, according to figures of the World Bank, 4.4 billion world citizens using at least once in a week the internet, I think we can all agree that the disruptive impact has, it is very difficult to compare it to what happened before, but it should be comparable, for instance, to what happened in the 15th century when the printing was invented by Gutenberg. And by the way, we can see some parallels in the reactions by society. Uh, between the 15th century and the 21st century. In any way, uh, the internet now is massively used, and we heard already in different panels referring to uh, the pros and the downsides of the use of internet. Massive use in education, access to education, massive abuse sometimes, positive sides and downsides. In any way, Globalization through a free market economy, but also through the massive use of ICT, is a fact of life uh, today. And we've seen that uh, public authorities try to tackle the challenges presented by this massive use of ICT and the Internet. And that's kind of the core of the discussion we will try to have this morning. Confronted with some downsides to what is currently the use of the World Wide Web? How should society, how should all the stakeholders in what's happening, how should they try to tackle the abuses, the downsides, the negative impact of the use of ICT, and of course, on the other hand, try to promote more the positive sides? We see that public authorities try to regulate, they try to take initiatives, they try to even vote laws, have police forces. Yesterday I heard in the news that the Spanish authorities decided to appoint 18 special police forces that will control the political campaigns for the April campaign, electoral campaign in Spain. Yesterday also in France there was a big debate about the uh, potential impact of the new law that was uh, uh, voted by the Macron government to uh, to uh, attack the fake news uh, phenomenon. So there's a lot of discussion about the possibility to regulate, the potential to impactfully regulate and to act as public authorities to contravene abuse. Of course, the future of representative democracy also and the quality of decision making is at stake. Lots of initiatives are also taken in that field to see with the best experts what could be done. The institution I have the honor to lead, International IDEA, is together with the Kofi Annan Foundation and the Stanford University, we are working on what we call a framework for a better digital democracy. But we are not the only ones. Lots of initiatives are taken. And so I think this panel should try to 
uh, give you a bit of insight in the thinking about the very difficult balance to strike between the positive, the plus side of the internet, easy access, horizontality, informality, easy access to information, to education, a possibility also to participate in the debate, and all that should be promoted, but on the other hand, how to tackle these downsides, the ambition would be in this a little bit more than one hour to give the floor to colleagues to give you a bit of insight in the present uh, thinking about this very important uh, issue. I will introduce my fellow panelists, and it's a, a really high, very high level panel, I call the panels we already had here. Um, I will introduce them one by one when I give them the floor. The idea is that they briefly make their point from their point of view uh, about what I just depicted as uh, the key challenges and that then they can interact and of course we will also like in the other, uh, in the case of the other panels, will give you the opportunity to give your view because it's, uh, as I mentioned, amongst, I'm sure, and I already saw it, that amongst the 4.4 present users, 4.4 billion of present users of the internet, that you also are amongst them and so by definition, you also have an idea, you also have a view on this. The first person I will invite to take the floor is Susan Ness. And Susan Ness has current activities, uh, amongst others, as a distinguished fellow of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. But the reason why she's present in this panel here is that I refer to the birth of the internet in California. Susan Ness was very active in the last couple of uh, decades in the US, um, close to uh, President Obama, and as a member of the Federal uh, Communications Commission, she was very active in the field of what public authorities should do to guarantee the quality of communications in the area of the World Wide Web. I will give her the floor, and I think you not only will speak, but you will also illustrate what you will uh, tell to the people via a short video message, so please be, uh, pay attention to what's next intervention by Susan Ness, please. Thank you so much, Eve. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I've been asked also just to explain a little bit more about the area. So, but before I begin, I would um, like everyone to take the following pledge. So raise whichever hand you'd like and repeat after me, I will no longer use the term fake news. Fake news. Through blatant misuse of those two words, the term has become really a label for whatever statement that the speaker objects to. And as Eve has uh, said so eloquently, as usage has grown exponentially, so is the amount of false information going viral on the web. And our, the malevolent campaigns that um, have also been leashed, unleashed have wreaked havoc with our elections, not just in the United States, but around the world. So politicians are scrambling to get their arms around the issue um, and as Ismail said yesterday, and as Eve was saying, that both European and U.S. legislators are, have their legislative ha um, pens poised. But I would argue that in the rush to legislate prior to elections, oftentimes, as a former regulator, I know this, um, that often leads to bad regulation, which can have a very um, uh, negative impact on freedom of expression. And in fact, the project that I'm doing with the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, we've uh, put together a high-level transatlantic group, uh, including legislators, uh, members of government, tech companies, uh, civil society, and academics, to examine all of the um, approaches to um, content online to, uh, and to determine what are the best practices to address hate speech, violent extremism, and um, disinformation online without harming freedom of expression. A few definitions. 
information integrity, which is the topic here, trustworthiness and dependability of information, misinformation, is false information that's uh, possibly a mistake, circulated potentially without ill intent. Disinformation is circulated knowing that it is false with the intent to deceive. That would be like deceptive advertising. Um, it could be deception as to who the sender or the advertiser is or the purpose for sending that information. You could have doctored photos, videos, or sound recordings. And in a few minutes, we'll see a little tape of what's called deep fakes. Viral deception is a term uh, that um, Kathleen Hall Jamison, a professor at Annenberg, uh, coined. And that emphasizes the harm that comes when uh, disinformation goes viral. Uh, its initials are VD something you don't want to have, nor do you wish to give to others. Um, here are just, just some quick catch words. Um, the ABCs of social media issues, thanks to my colleague, Danielle Francois. It applies both to hate speech as well as to disinformation. A is for deceptive actor. B is for bad behavior and C is for corrosive content. Uh, as far as actors go, some bad actors are economic actors. They circulate emails or tweets uh, with outrageous messages that they've composed, and they do it to create clickbait, to get people to click on them so that they can monetize the traffic that they've generated. Platforms should and are beginning to demonetize these bad actors, um, and that does a great job of eliminating their uh, spread of disinformation. Other bad actors circulate deceptive material with the intent of doing harm, harming institutions, causing our society to break down into angry tribes, clashes within a country, or interfering in uh, elections. Um, another area is, is the actor who he says he is. Do you allow anonymity? Um, some uh, countries want to prohibit it, but what about people speaking out against government corruption? Do they need anonymity in the cause of good democracy? So these are some issues. There are always unintended consequences from good intentions of trying to regulate online content. B is for bad behavior. Terms of service and community standards try to address it. Um, they've identified coordinated, inauthentic behavior, that is the use of bots or fake accounts, and have been trying to take them down. Uh, access to private information uh, uh, regarding religion or um, politics or other sensitive categories, oftentimes these are areas that they abuse. That would be bad behavior. Um, uh, C, as I mentioned, is for corrosive content. Disinformation may be harmful, but often is not illegal. It's, so it's important that government authorities stay clear of actually regulating content itself. Platforms have terms of service and community standards. They need to give clear rules on what is not allowed on the platform and then enforce it um, consistently political advertisers, this is a great area where uh, regulation uh, can take place. Platforms should identify the sources and the amount of funding, um, who, the, uh, who is paying for it, who they really are, which voters they are targeting. These abuses are as old as democracy, but online the targeted message may be delivered from outside the country and from bots making it appear that the message is far more popular than it really is. Uh, now, if it's an external attack that impacts elections, that's not a content issue, that's a national security issue. And you have other areas of government that, and companies uh, and civil society trying to address those issues. Sliming coordinated attacks on celebrities and reporters, um, oftentimes taking a video 
doctoring it or uh, a photo, um, maybe it's um, uh, for female reporters, uh, and blackmailing them to stop reporting on issues, uh, otherwise they will spread this horrible uh, stuff online. Um, then uh, what I uh, promised that I would go to is another area which is called deep fakes. These are videos, or they could be uh, audio content, um, where they've taken um, an individual and through AI have manipulated the video so the person is saying something that the person would never say. And if you put this in an electron context, that could be really very dangerous. So uh, we're going to show you a one-minute video uh, illustrating how this works. Um, please um, ignore some of the content because it's a little raunchy. Go ahead, please. Uh, why don't we try to come back to this later? You'll stay for the, for the whole panel. Um, basically, ways to fight back. Quality of content, is it trustworthy? There are groups that are uh, really working hard to, to identify uh, bringing fact checkers together from around the world, um, digital literacy education, which is not just for kids, the folks who, in the United States at least who have been spreading disinformation the most have been older white men. Um, so we need uh, digital literacy education across the board. Um, so those are just two of the ways, and I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know if the video is ready now to be shown. If that is not the case, we will see in the, in the course of the panel. I would like to go to the second uh, person to intervene, and thank you to Susan for kind of setting the scene, including some definitions, because I think it's indeed important to know very well what we're talking about and what we're not talking about. I would like to uh, give the floor now to um, former President Luczynski. Um, who happened to be uh, the only uh, person, I think, that has been president, and he was president under the Soviet era of uh, Tajikistan and Moldova, uh, which is quite exceptional to be president of, uh, have been president of two uh, republics. But I think the uh, very interesting other aspect of the career of President Lushinsky is that under the Soviet era, he's been in charge, he's been responsible for as aspects of mass communication, uh, of course, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So I would like to uh, listen to his intervention, also from the point of view of a kind of comparison between what was uh, the practice 25, 30, 40 years ago and now. Please, you have the floor. I think you will speak in Russian, so maybe we can use, for the people need it, uh, that need it, we can use our headsets. Today, in the morning, when I heard the statements, we talk about 4.4 billion people, 4.4 internet users that are using internet. Do you hear that interpretation? Is it okay, Tess? Do you hear the interpretation? 4.4 billion people that are using internet from time to time. Now there is a question to pose. So. Practically, there are about 4.4 that are not using Internet. 4.4 that are using from time to time. But, but the dynamic of the growth is incredible. We have lived in an era where 100 or 400 years, virtually without any change, and the Internet can be viewed as a nuclear bomb, if you like, because the change were titanic and are now very rapid. In my life, I managed the mass communication in the Soviet times, and in the latest Politburo, Perestroika, I was responsible for m m pre press and mass media, both in Moldova and Tajikistan. I faced these issues very often. There are problems that are similar. Some of them still remain factual these days. One of the examples to cite, for example, one of the founding fathers of the United States, Jefferson, in 
in 1787, he was saying that if he would have to choose the government or the press, he would still remain with the press. But in 20 years, what is he saying? He was used to say that it's Im you need to restrict the press. And there is no absolute freedom. Next, you cannot trust press, and so on and so forth. And this view is still with us. One thing is when you are in power, the way you view the press, and the one when, when you are without power. The not public figures and those people who are not linked to certain administration or organization, each and every one of us, we look at the opposition press. We would like to hear something that is not said by the government because whatever the government says, the people are not trusting it so much because the issue here about the accurate and uh, verified information is one of the key challenges now. The fake trolls and many different terms that have been coined. How can we all realize what is what? There is also alternative information, but I need to repeat myself that there are billions of people that cannot find the alternative information. Then from the other side, you have the information crisis, but the mentality is the same. The mentality, like in the, if you talk about the post-Soviet Union, is to trust for the press, is to trust what we are told. Therefore, it's very skillfully used by different groups, including parties, groups of people, and the owners of the media outlets to promote their own particular agendas, solve their problems, and disinform and misguide the people. Recently, we have been in Istanbul and discussed the issues of populism, and the populism will be growing because it also has different sources and different framework, but it will grow because people are misinformed and they start to believe what they are told. Other than that, it's very difficult for people now to move its agenda without populism. If you're if you're not promising anything, you are not elected. Therefore, they issue the selective retention and the selective approach to the information is a complicated issue to solve. Let's pick up any industry, health services, lawyers, notary offices. You need a license. To, you need certain access to this industry, but you don't need any license. You don't need any conditions to become a, an MP or a president and media representative. Basically, anyone but you need to understand that there are people, good people, the specialists and qualified individuals that cannot promote themselves and probably do not want. They want other people to invite them as professionals to be invited. But this is, you know, virtually an, an exception nowadays. And for the press, I pose the same question. When I was working in Moldova, we were building up the journalism faculty in the university. And for the admission to the journalism, you need to have two years of experience before you actually get enrolled. And now I am asking everywhere, and again I repeat, it is the concept itself, the media concept is so wide specifically in, in the context of the information technologies now. Therefore, you have many unqualified people who go there and start to serve the interest of certain owners of the media outlets. And there's a question that arises from this. The media, any type of media, it has to be financed, isn't it? So the one who pays, that is the one who dictates its conditions in terms of editor. The independent press, where is it? I don't know. Well, maybe the government. Well, the government has its certain newspaper, and, but everything is basically private. 
In Moldova, for instance, 80% of mass media is concentrated in the hands of one individual. And of course, yes, we can talk about different things, and but everyone knows that it is his business. In all these many, many countries, in the neighboring countries, we see the same, more or less the same situation. We pay, right? We pay, we pay taxes to have good roads. I think we need to pay via budget, or I don't. I understand that additional tax is a burden, but the mass media can destabilize any situation. Therefore, to have an independent and autonomous mass media, you need to finance them. And the finance is, goes at the expense of the ads, and ads, of course, you know, is usually managed in the ha by, the, by the same people. The sa the, another issue is about how we prepare the journalists. I have touched upon this briefly. Again, how do we prepare the journalists? Even today, we talk about the qualification of the journalists. And in Spain, in France, and they start to, you know, put some other qualifications or limits. But today's world is, is so, is doing everything is possible. It comes late. Look at the migration. What happens with migration in Europe? You filled in the entire Europe with migrants, and but before that, you haven't thought about the some tangible measures. I think the same situation is about the mass media. We need to realize one important thing for all of us, that first of all, the media needs to objectively cover the story, not in the way you do it, like, not in the interpretation. The interpretation is also the issue in all legal matters, not the actions, but the interpretations, you see. But you need to cover the story without bias. And before everything happens, before the problems develop, we need to take some preventive measures. We have to be proactive and not reactive. All activities, any law, any constitution, all of them limit our performance. Whether you are a car driver or some someone else, the mass media in its publications, they also need to have a certain idea of measurement this has to be discussed regionally and globally. You don't need, you don't need to be afraid of that. Some people say, "Hey, don't touch press, don't touch press," or let's let's say not talk about how we shut down a press organization. That's a very frightening thing. But at the same time, I want to protect the media also because the government, the state, do not provide. Me, information to media. The media, the alternative media, is usually up, ha, ha, dealing with this information in an oppositional way. Some many cases, media has to look for fakes, for some rumors, from hearsay, and collect this information from the sources that are not probably verifiable. And to conclude my statement, I would like to say that we use the mass media, this term, but to make sure that these are not mass destruction, we need to create some rules of the game. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you rightly pointed at the need to address issues with, uh, with media, with independence of media, freedom of expression, freedom of media, but also conditions of independence the issue of the financing, the qualification of journalists, and so on. I'm sure that we will come back on these issues. I would like now to turn to uh, Prime Minister Aziz, who's Prime Minister from 2004 to 2007 of Pakistan, the fifth biggest nation in the world in terms of uh, citizens. Um, you were born uh, in a family with a father that was a radio engineer. He was one of the leaders, uh, or maybe the leader, of the public broadcasting company. You, in your tenure as a prime minister, as far as I'm well informed, uh, one of your very important policy uh, achievements was to uh, unleash the potential of uh, radio and telecommunication in your country. 
uh, maybe you can look back on that period, draw some lessons, and tell us a little bit how you see the role of ICT and, and the integrity of information in the emancipation of your vast nation with its very young uh, population on average. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, Pakistan is a small country, 300 million people. With all the challenges you can think of, it was certainly quite a change for me from working at 399 Park Avenue, City Bank headquarters, to the President, Prime Minister's Secretariat in Islamabad. Call it uh, shock treatment, perhaps. But coming to our topic today, uh, we live in a digitized world, ladies and gentlemen, and sometimes we don't realize how much the world has changed. One impact related to media and the news is that the concept of going early in the morning and picking up your morning paper from the garden and coming in and getting news is over now because news is available as a continuous 24-hour delivery process. The morning newspaper is less important. Now, you, the op-eds and all that could be interesting, but really in the morning newspaper, one hardly gets news if you're watching everything else and the various other mechanisms which exist today. So first of all, we must recognize that the menu has changed. Number two, globalization has arrived. So our interest in news is much broader, much deeper than it used to be maybe 20 years ago or even 15 years ago. So local news is there, but the global news overrides everything now in the front pages of most newspapers. And uh, so our minds have to be adjusted. Having said that, I think we must also realize that in a digitized world, uh, we can pick and choo choose our news. The menu is much bigger, which means it is confusing. Also, there's proliferation of news and data every morning. When it, or, now it's no longer morning. Now it's 24 by 7. So how do you filter all this? The requirements are very different than they used to be. And we have to readjust, frankly, how we look at the news today, whether you are prime minister, whether you are driving a cab, whether you are at home uh, cooking the meal, you have to now adapt and adjust accordingly. Also, may I say that in the digitized world, and let's not be in denial, that is a reality. The thing we have to develop as individuals, as human beings, as civil society, is filters. The key filter in your mind will separate the facts from the opinion and separate the truth from the lies. That responsibility now is yours because it's a, a media to a large extent is an open pipe now. Everything is put through, priority can change, and you cannot just accept everything the same way. So your, if your filters are not working, you may end up with wrong interpretations or wrong conclusions to the news. And that is what I think is a big mega change in what is happening today. Now, as a prime minister coming from the private sector, never been in government, uh, it was quite a challenge for me handling that, the press we used to de deal with to, at Citibank versus what you deal with with the government. The, what I discovered is that we can learn from each other. All key editors, if you are the prime minister of a country, all key editors, all key reporters and opinion columnists should be your part of your ecosystem. There may be other factors too. And if you talk to these people before something dramatic happens or an incident happens, and they have an idea of your thinking on major issues, it helps produce a better and more accurate story when the story does come. But then you must know your subject. You can't have 15 aides sitting there giving you chits every two minutes, say this, don't say that. So you either take it on the chest, prepare, know your subject, be hands-on, that impresses the press. And if you're always looking to your aides, I'm not against aides. I mean, you need people to guide you, and the impact will be reduced substantially. So you've got to pick and choose. What are the topics? I'll be a real current expert. Others where I'll be aware of what's going on. And the third, I learn before the press interaction so that I can say. And so the filtering of news is a universal phenomenon now for all of us. You don't have to be a politician, you can be a housewife, you can be a teacher. You must filter what you get. 
And part of what we see in the world today is that our filters are not working as effectively as they should. You look at what happened in New Zealand the other day. Obviously, a lot of us are in pain and shocked what happened. And hopefully, uh, the government there will deal with it and to share with us what happened. But these type of situation brewing in a very civilized country, educated country, people coming out and really uh, behaving in a very unusual way happened just within 24 hours of where we are today. So this tells us that rear view mirror, uh, driving, looking at the rear view mirror alone in the uh, concept of media will not get you there. We have to continuously change. We have to change the dynamic. We have to uh, ask our staff, what have you heard today? What are the correct stories? What are the wrong stories? How did the wrong stories come? Why didn't we speak to that reporter? Do you know him or her? What, you know, th so these are the type of discussions I used to have. I drove them crazy, probably. But this is the way you have to build a sense of urgency and a sense of commitment in your own team. We have tons of people working there, but if you don't direct them, you will get the same fake news coming every day. You, know, you can't stop it. And you must have your shock absorbers ready to take fake news, sometimes on you too, and personal news. But you can't not act and go back to these people and meet them when you don't need to see, have a story. My best interviews or meetings, not interviews, meetings with the press at my request but when I didn't want a story, I just wanted to talk about background. Probe them, tell me, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? First of all, it makes the journalists very happy that the Prime Minister is asking for feedback. Secondly, they then get a slight sense of responsibility. Yeah, these people are really, their agenda is good. They want to improve the country. So let's see if, whether we can help, or let's, uh, if we are opposed to it ideologically, then they'll go after you. So the point is, there is no cookie-cutter approach in handling the media. Whether you are in New York, whether you... I've personally lived, not visited, uh, in 10, 12 countries, and visited about 110 last count I. So uh, globality doesn't come by traveling. Globality comes in your mindset, in your ability, that you work... And this I learned at Citibank, this is not a commercial for them, out of the 15 senior management in Citibank, eight were non-U.S. citizens and seven were U.S. citizens. Here's the largest bank in the United States. But because John Reed, our chairman, believed in globality. Walter Riston, before him, believed in globality. So they brought in people. It wasn't a club. When you walked into the management boardroom, it was like a global, international, sort of United Nations type of atmosphere. So if the point is, Globality is a reality, you can't fight it. The cycle times for media to react to stories is now almost zero, i.e. it'll come immediately. So you have to be on your toes, and you have to have the machinery to deal with it. And you must deal with facts, not fiction. If you try to maneuver the press, they'll get you, they'll find out, and I would never recommend anybody trying to even attempt that. If you made a mistake, say, Ladies and gentlemen, I blew, on, blew it on this particular initiative or reform or whatever. But an active government also is active in generating quality news. Not to feed the media only, but to feed the people as to what their government is doing. What are they, who they elected, who they selected or whatever. And this is what that particular individual is doing. Once you share people, uh, uh, share with people what you are doing and why. The why is very important. You'll see your brand will improve, your ratings will improve, and people will uh, support you. Having said that, don't, be, don't jump off the ceiling if you get criticism. We used to get it every morning, but uh, after a while your skin becomes thicker, and that's where you then can handle this. So in conclusion, let me say that effective media management is key. Don't just talk to the editor, talk to the senior reporters, sit one on one with them, you will get such dividends you have no idea. Because these are the people who control the print. And we want to have in print the facts, not fiction. If you give fiction once, next time you'll be lynched. So you have to really be responsible and the press must believe that you will speak the truth, you will explain what went wrong, explain what went well, and why you did what you did.
That's very important. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. So we heard about uh, the point of view in the um, Soviet Union to the new uh, situation. Uh, we heard about uh, Asia or, or testimonial based on experience in, in Asia. Let's now turn to the Middle East. We have the privilege to have amongst us uh, Mrs. Idzik, uh, who was uh, speaker of the Knesset and also caretaking uh, leader of Israel in 2007. I could imagine that um, ICT, fake news, and so on also sometimes fuels antagonism. Yeah. But uh, you're not here to focus on that. Yes. Uh, but and please, conflict, uh, uh, how do you see yeah. this very difficult balance to strike between freedom of speech and on the other hand, responsibility to uh, cater for uh, reality, facts, uh, to protect media integrity? Please. Thank you. I have been a public figure for 30 years. And I must tell you, I, I'm sure that you feel uh, this um, fake news is not you. Uh, the only difference is that uh, today we have better means for it. The media uh, evolution, uh, revolution, allowing fast distribution of information. Social media became connecting thousands of people, have become so quick and easy today. Everybody in his home is journalist, is editor, he has media, he can distribute the media so fast, it's so easy. And the only question, how, what can we do in order to prevent fake news? So, you know, I'm teaching government in university now. And I was shocked to see the students um, read news, fake news, sometimes, and they don't ask questions. Why? Uh, what is the hidden agenda? Why they uh, publish this? Uh, why they not publish uh, some issues? What is the money behind this uh, uh, issue? And, you know, uh, Prime Minister Shaukauta Brazis talk about filters. And see, I think the, the main filters is to teach students in the school systematically uh, how we um, teach them to teach or to create a reading, critic reading or critic thinking of text. Look, ask question, why, who, where, um, who benefit from it. It's also important to ask uh, uh, why something not published. So, as I said, we are all of us now journalists. But when you have Prime Minister Belgium, you ask me about the, uh, when you live in a conflict area, you are right. When you live in a conflict area, like we live in Israel, in the Middle East, it's much more difficult because part of the war is in the media, psychologic war. Uh, and it also depends on the culture, you know. I don't want even to, uh, you know, it's international problem, so I don't want to enter to politics. But just to give you an, an example, BDS, which is considered as, so to speak, you know, organization who wants to describe Israel as a, uh, you know, killing children and so so forth. I, I, I just want to tell you that it's also a matter of, of, of culture. Uh, prevent yourself of exaggeration, not to exaggerate. Not when you see funeral, you don't discover the bodies. Something uh, that we try, we are not succeeded always, but we try not to be so exaggerate, because, because otherwise even the public will criticize you. What are you talking about? We cannot believe uh, to your words anymore because you lied before and so on. In Israel, we have election now. So in election, generally, naturally, it becomes very difficult because everybody wants to, to be the first one who to reach the media, who, he wants to be the first one who to spread his lies or, or you know. So what I try to say that those filters must be, I don't see the train already left the station. And I don't believe in a self-regulation. You know why? 
it's a matter of rating. Rating is money. And they want to earn money. This is the truth. Now, what we can do is really uh, to teach, as I said, systematically in the school, to begin from the elementary school, even from the kindergarten. Watch what you see. Ask questions. Why they, they edited? Why they wrote what they wrote? Otherwise, I will be very happy. We try to uh, create in the uh, university now kind of treaty, principles of treaty with the students. Uh, some of them, they gave me some nice ideas. I'm not sure that we can fulfill, uh, fulfill them, but I'm sure that we can give the government some ideas. But it's very sensitive. We need to see how we keep the uh, freedom of expressing yourself and, and so forth. But, uh, you know, this is technology. Technology is very important, and we need to see, uh, like everywhere, the balance between being uh, used them and not to believe them sometimes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn now to Europe. Please. Let's turn now to Europe. We have uh, two colleagues in the panel uh, from uh, Europe. Not so far, the one country is not so far located from the other. I would like to start with Jan Fischer, uh, Prime Minister Jan Fischer of the Czech Republic, um, economist, econometrist from training and during a very long time, quite a long time, head of the statistical office in uh, the Czech Republic, and so very familiar to facts, figures, and the way they are translated into news, or not translated very rightly into news. So after hearing the colleagues, I would like uh, to give the floor to you to ask you how you see the responsibility of public authorities and the role of um, ICT, mass communication, in uh, opinion building, and. Uh, how to try to cater for the truth and the facts, please. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here again at this exciting event as the Bacchus Forum actually represents. We have the agenda of this panel is very, very sheer, and we could discuss it many, not hours, but many days. So just I limit myself to, let's say, highlighting some things which I consider as important, uh, relevant, and to the, uh, to the point. Uh, the first thing is media. The second thing is uh, information and uh, security and security, security, security issues. And uh, last but not least, the fundamental question is to regulate or not to regulate? That's the question. So uh, it could sound as it could be said a very uh, natural, of the trivial phrase now, that we live in the information, information society. But it's true, it's right, that's unavoidable, I would say, and we live in these societies where uh, many times uh, the information is more worthy than the material product. Uh, Sometimes people think, and this is some kind of misunderstanding, that information means a fact or a set of facts. It's not true. Information is also the interpretation, analysis. What do you want? That's not uh, information cannot be information isn't some part of knowledge. Information is not some group of facts, clear findings, or something like that. Also, the distortion of information, biasing information, that's also the phenomena of the modern information, information society. But what I would like to stress is the, could be said, I would like to speak about the relationship between uh, information, misinformation, and 
politics and politicians. This is what I would like to limit myself in this interven short intervention. First of all, media. The first thing is the classical media are not dying. We have an opportunity to take in the morning, in the evening, as you like it, uh, seriously looking, seriously, seriously looking newspaper we can read farther on uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine, we can read uh, Le Monde, Guardian, what we are used to. And we have the broadcasting, we have TV, and we have the group of tabloids. Anyway, so that's what you, what you wish and what you want. It's not a problem. That's not a problem. The, that's not a death of or dying of classical media, and some could be said coming, coming of the social networking and just an intranet. That's not true. Media and democracy. If you want to measure the level and to speak and to assess the level and the quality of democracy, you can have several criteria. But the freedom of media is somewhere at the top of the list. So that's the, my opinion is, let's be very cautious and very careful to speak about the regulations. Of course, advertising needs to have a rules of the game. Uh, the media, the role of media in the political and election campaigning needs some kind of the, of the rules of the game. But no rules of the game as concerns the content anyway. I would be very, very cautious to do anything in this, in, in this field. But I will drop some words on it a little bit later, later on. The role of media can be very positive and also very negative. We know what a shameful role media played in times of totalitarian regimes, in Nazi era, in communism, and how the media were used or disused, as you like it, as a destroyer of democracy, as a destroyer of democracy, not only a builder. And that's the fact you will have on, on, uh, on mind. And of course, that the, the, that's very interesting. Politicians, even in democracies, have the never-ending and endless appetite to influence media, to look at them, to do something with them, to play something about them, which is very, very dangerous in the case of public media, public TV, public broadcasting. And we have to be kept on mind that we, if we, let's say, look and care for the freedom of media, that way we care for the quality of, uh, of, uh, of, of, democra of uh, democracies. Of course, media and business, this is a very interesting thing. And that fact that it could be said that a lot of industrial or business tycoons they are owning newspaper, publishing houses, editing houses, as the case of my country. OK, never mind, so someone has to, has to own it anyway. So that's not, I'm not nervous from this fact. But I'm getting nervous where someone is stepping in in the politics. What, if you want a case, that's the case of the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic. What he did, just for sure, when he was stepping in at the politics, by chance, he bought the second biggest publishing house in the country with two very relevant and influential, influential titles. So the politicians know very well uh, what, uh, how the, uh, the media are very strong, very strong and influential asset in their hands. So, the, and now social, social networks, social networks. 
it's not the it's not a substitute of classical media. It's something complementary. It's competing, of course. But the problem it could be the role of social networks. It was mentioned several has been mentioned several times here. Could be very very positive in totalitarian regimes in that kind of systems. The mobilizing of the let's say activities of the protesters and so on and so forth. The use of the uh, of the social networks is extremely important, extremely, extremely positive. And the politicians in that kind of regimes, the leaders know pretty well that they and they are doing their best to limit, to restrict this way of communication. The other thing is, of course, that the that's a very specific space, the social social networks. Uh, you can stay or you can remain absolutely anonymous. That's the first thing. You can, let's say, uh, reveal the views or you can pronounce the statements you wouldn't never pronounce openly, publicly. Because it's not, let's say, I would say, German salon fähig. That's not, that's not. I would say, good and accept it. But you can do it using social networking every hour, every minute, every day. And now I know what I'm talking about. When I was campaigning for the position of the president of the Czech Republic, and I was in position that I never have keep in secret my Jewish origin. You cannot imagine the spillover of antisemitism, what was written under the line of the blogs, of the articles, and so on. I haven't, I haven't got any problem. I have, to, I have got a problem to read it, of course. But I haven't got any problem I, that it was written and published, even surprisingly, perhaps. What was surprising for me, and what I was nervous about, that no one said a, a single word. Editors in chief, politicians, nothing like that. Nothing like that. That was the, that's not unacceptable in this society, in this level of the development of the democracy. And, uh, nothing like that. That was very gloomy. Not the fact that it was revealed and some were published and readable. So this is social, social networks. The, there is one very, very, very dangerous illusion. Social networks cannot replace the uh, life in the real communities. That's illusion anyway. And people live in this, uh, users of social networks, are, it's user, they are kings, they are, let's say, ruling the community. Unlikely in the real community, we are, the fa we are confronted face to face. You have to advocate uh, you, your, your views, you have to bring some ideas which are confronted with your opponents, just on place. By the way, that's the reasons that a lot of politicians likes to use social networks, because they use it, they use Twitter, they use Facebook, saying something, and the huge teams surrounding them are writing, uh, gathering the information, uh, mis disinformation, and I don't know, I don't know what, and the politicians are not confronted in campaigning, in, consume, in time of consuming their positions. Nothing like that. That's the very comfortable life. Very comfortable life. So, the, the, I am coming to the, to the, to the, to the end. One thing I mentioned, uh, this is, and this is very important information and, and, def uh, and, and, sec and security. This is very important thing that the classical information haven't got any, any limits and any borders. And we are witnessing the era where the, one of the most serious, if, one of the most serious battlefields will be the cyberspace. 
with hacking, with disusing of information, with fake news, with conspiracy theories, but with the, let's say, the threatening of the even armed forces of the, of the opponent or enemy, and so on and so forth. This is very, very complicated. Regulation, the last two, two things. Hmm. Unlikely others, I would say, uh, the, I would be very cautious. Uh, you can regulate everything in the totalitarian, uh, authoritarian regimes, no problem. But in democracies, if something should be regulated, it should be regulated in purely, purely democratic way as a result of the political debate among politicians, among legislators. And if you have to be, if you should be restricted, it should be based on the law and on the constitution, let's say, so otherwise I'm in no bureaucratic or administrative way uh, organized res uh, restriction or regulation of these, of these very fragile and sensitive things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Fischer. This is very clear. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned before, thinking about in France the new law on fake news, about yesterday the Spanish government appointing 18 police people to control the, uh, the campaign for the next elections in Spain, to regulate or not to regulate. Can I give you the Shakespeare role? Alfred Gusenbauer, former Chancellor of Austria, please. Very fascinating debate uh, initiated by Ness when setting the stage. We had an event organized by the Club de Madrid some months ago in, in Riga on a similar issue. And back then, our president, uh, Vika Freiberger, recommended uh, to me and to us to read a fascinating book written by Umberto Eco, and the title of the book is The Symmetry of Prague. And uh, why did she recommend that? Because in this novel, you get a very precise understanding of how false news emerge and how they were used. And of course, those of you who know the book know that uh, this is about how came into existence uh, this famous fake, the wise man of Zion, which then was misused by Adolf Hitler in order to make his case about the Jewish world conspiracy as one of his main propaganda arguments to organize the Shoah, which is one or the most terrible uh, story in the history of mankind. But it started with the creation of false news. Uh, and this dates back to a period around 100 years ago. And what has changed in this 100 years? In this 100 years, we witness nowadays that the dispersion of, of false news is so easy, so omnipresent, and together with the commercialization, uh, of uh, false news, we are in a completely different era because we are not talking about energy and jobs and whatever. We're talking about data, which seems to be the main new uh, commodity or raw material uh, in the world. And you cannot endlessly produce gold and you cannot endlessly produce oil, but it seems that you endlessly can produce data based on facts or on false facts. And I think some of the uneasiness of our times originates from uh, the experience and the feeling that we are living in this dichotomy that on the one hand we want to protect uh, the freedom of speech and free opinion. Uh, and on the other hand, we see the enormous downsides uh, of false facts that can affect the individuals in their lives, in their aspirations, in their uh, economic uh, forthcoming, 
but they can also determine uh, the future of states and nations. And therefore, we have to come to answers in one way or the other. And I always like to look back, uh, because then you learn what worked and what did not work, and under which circumstances. And I think one of the lessons to draw from the past is that maybe we have to be a little bit more clear again about what we call the classic Montesquieuan uh, separation of powers, which is, as you know, legislative, executive, and judicative. And in the 20th century, we added media as the fourth power. But nowadays, this separation of powers has become quite weird, because it doesn't exist in many places anymore. It's all mixed up. And uh, as you mentioned, in the Czech Republic, the by now prime minister uh, before bought two major newspapers, etc., etc., which puts him, of course, in a completely different position to run for office. Under the classic understanding of the separation of powers, this would be an unacceptable step. And therefore, what I want to put in front of you is, let's rethink what the classic separation of powers would mean under the new circumstances in order to have this separation of powers also in practice. Second thing, regulation or non-regulation. A regulation is unavoidable. And I completely agree with my colleague Jan Fischer that it has to be done under democratic rules, for sure. But, uh, I mean, look to street traffic. And street traffic is small compared to what we experience nowadays in data. But imagine that street traffic would be unregulated. I mean, we would... Uh, live in the jungle. And in a way, nowadays, we are living in the data jungle. Yeah? And therefore, of course, regulation, solid uh, regulation, uh, is unavoidable. Of course, I, this does not speak against uh, self-regulatory measures, not at all. And regulation, of course, is not the entire wisdom in this context. Because what we have to uh, look into it is we need a democratic public sphere where debate, exchange, and conversation can take place. And of course, a democratic public sphere is not only the result of bold regulation, but of different actors. And I think it was very useful for quite some time, maybe even today, that you have something like public broadcasting and not only private broadcasting. So in order to establish also in the net platforms and institutions that are now the modern expression what has, of what has been before public broadcasting, understood as the democratic access to information and exchange, I think are additional elements that could be helpful in order to establish uh, such, such a public sphere. One issue that uh, I think is very important, I think it was also mentioned by Eunice at the beginning, uh, what are we doing with corrupt governments? And uh, if we are limiting the access to social media, do we not protect the wrong ones? And this menace is there. But there could be policies, let's say, of extended whistleblower character uh, that would bridge this, uh, uh, this problem that on the one hand, we want to have solid data. On the other hand, we do not want to protect corrupt governments and encourage and empower the individual uh, to take part in that. So there can be, there can be solutions 
found uh, for this uh, for this type of uh, of cleavages, but they are they are uh, they are detrimental for the future uh, of our democracies. And what I think is, there has been a lot of talk about media and journalists and whatsoever. There are good ones, better ones, and some that are not up to standard, but. The classic qualification of a journalist to deal with information, which is check, recheck, double check. This three step standard in order to approach information, I think still would be very valid if being implemented also in the activity in the net and not being only limited uh, to journals and TV and broadcasting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alfred Gusenbauer. <laughs> to check, to recheck and to double check, uh, you need time for that. And, and time is also a bit uh, the problem with uh, this very interesting discussion. Um, but thank you uh, for your excellent contribution. Um, last but not least, I will ask uh, Sally Painter Chief Operating uh, Officer of Blue Star Strategies, private company, consultancy, consulting to uh, public authorities and also uh, uh, investment uh, decision-making bodies uh, and, and private companies. Uh, what is your take about what you've heard in terms of setting the scene and the ideas of how public authorities should react? And after you, we will turn to a couple of conclusions or uh, reactions by Susan Ness. And I would like to uh, warn already the technician that we then would like to have a second attempt to watch that uh, long-awaited video. Please, Mrs. Painter, you have the floor. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here again at Baku for this annual and timely conference. And I also want to give a special thanks to Roshan and his team, who I think have done a wonderful job today. As we've just heard from this illustrious panel of leaders, the challenges protecting information integrity and the risks of disinformation in today's world are significant and they are increasing. And I'd like to assert that I believe that the private sector has a unique role to play in working to protect information integrity and to provide a democratic defense against disinformation. Briefly, I would like to describe the forward-thinking strategic initiative that the private sector could develop by taking a leadership position on this vital topic. Such an initiative is critically important if we all want to have a true and lasting impact because at the end of the day, we can have the greatest ideas in the world and all the technical fixes at the ready and we still may not have made a dent in the challenge. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about those of us who've been following this to see some of the lessons learned on the topic. First, this challenge is broader than any single actor. Second, a successful response must engage the whole society. And third, we must continue to work together to learn from each other's mistakes and successes and craft a government and a non-governmental solution. Our goal is to identify democratic solutions in the short term and bid, build societal resistance in the long term. We need concrete solutions that can be rapidly implemented, tested, and refined. And the plan needs to evolve as many of the people that cause the threat as they move forward. To make a dent, we have to move the debate among the right people the right stakeholders. We have to unite these players, get them energized, and create a drumbeat. A drumbeat that reverberates in a way that makes the policy climate amenable to enacting our goals. We have to leverage the key voices that have the actual power and wherewithal to do something, and to do it in a smart, strategic, and sustained way. Our strategy needs to look beyond policy and focus on our methods and our tools by governments, civil society, and private business. Having said that, sadly, it is clear that even some of our most important politicians, those politicians that have the power to make changes, 
are sometimes also the most ill-informed. Take, for example, the, US, the recent US congressional hearing on data privacy featuring embattled Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Lawmakers from both parties asked Zuckerberg numerous questions that revealed their fundamental lack of understanding of how the internet and e-commerce actually work. One senator even asked Zuckerberg how Facebook could sustain its business model in which users don't pay for the service. It was, incredible, it was an incredible admission of ignorance. And so this is our challenge, how to design and execute a strategic plan that fixes these misunderstandings and which moves the larger debate in a sustained way that supports and advances our goals. This process of how to move a policy is based on what I would suggest a couple of key elements. First, I'd like to su suggest the creation of something that a think tank in Washington, the Atlantic Council, has put forth. It's called the Counter Disinformation Coalition. It would be made up of like-minded government and non-governmental stakeholders to develop best practices, including standards for social media, such as a voluntary code of conduct. Coalition members could include international players from the UN, from the EU, including the European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats in Finland, or at NATO, the NATO Strategic Center for uh, Communications and Excellence, and the EU Commission, the high-level group on fake news. We could also pick representatives from the OSCE, the OECD, business associations, tech-savvy civil society and academic watchdogs, and of course the private sector leaders such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter. Second, I think we need to agree on a strong and clear agenda with defined goals. We can't solve every issue at the same time, so we have to do something that's doable and grow it over time. And third, I think we need to designate a leader or a facilitator to drive the agenda and run the coalition. Someone who has an established track record for getting big things done and with both public and private sector experience. This person needs to have this as their only job, waking up every day focused on how to combat this process. It can't be an agenda that could be sidetracked by some crisis. And that person also needs to be an honest broker. And finally, the fourth issue I think we need to address on, on a coalition like this is to execute a robust outreach and communication strategy. It needs to be one that directly advocates to diverse stakeholders to cultivate open lines of communication with regulators and to leverage third-party validators. Holding dialogues such as this around the globe is going to be of the utmost importance. And we need to create a sophisticated media strategy to make sure that our messages are getting to the right players. I'd welcome your comments uh, and would love to work with you on such an agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, briefly, Susan, what you heard and during your intervention, we could watch finally the uh, video you brought with you. Thank you. Okay, if the video is ready, just setting it up again, we're talking about uh, deep fakes. This is the ability using um, uh, automated systems machine learning to take uh, an image and then uh, put in words seemingly by that individual something that the individual did not say. So, are we ready to roll it this time? Okay, with sound. Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or, how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone, like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of bucked up dystopia. Thank you. Stay woke, bitches. 
Okay, basically what you just saw and was a little difficult to understand was an actor um, had, um, was talking and through AI, his words uh, and mouth, his facial expressions were given to um, a, a, an image of President Obama. So it appears that President Obama is saying the exact words and intonation that the actor was saying. Now this, is, this can be potentially, um, it, first of all, is difficult to detect. People tend to believe what they see and hear uh, and so if they saw President Obama saying terrible things, they would, it would be difficult for them to believe that he did not say it. They believe their eyes and ears. The flip side of that is also dangerous, and that is you can have um, uh, politicians uh, who have said terrible things say, oh no, that was just a deep fake. Somebody planted that um, where I didn't say that or do that. So this, we are in uncharted waters right now with technology um, providing the opportunity to do this. And it is getting less and less expensive to do and harder and harder to detect. There is the possibility of watermarking and there are uh, organizations that are able to clear, closely watch and can determine if something is a fake or not, but the average public cannot. For example, in that you did not see President Obama blinking very often. That's one of the little signs uh, that can tell you that it's a deep fake. Now, going back uh, to some of the other issues that we talked about, I just wanted to conclude with a couple of unintended consequences. As a result of some of the legislative pressure and efforts right now, for example, in Europe, um, we have the unintended consequence that um, the uh, requirement of takedown within a day or takedown within an hour uh, of notification of um, what may be viewed as being or claimed to be illegal content um, means uh, that the smaller platforms, and we always talk about the big US companies, but the smaller platforms are also tr having to comply or should comply, and it's extremely difficult for them to do so. So increasingly, you have very good companies that are competing with the larger ones, unable to do that. And what happens? The bad guys get thrown off of the big platforms that have the resources to detect them, and they go to the smaller platforms. Is this really um, a, a response that, that we want to have? So we need to be very careful about that. My message for anyone who's talking about regulation, use it as a last resort. You can, you can regulate with respect to the actors or the behaviors um, in an objective way, but be very careful about regulation of content. Don't deputize these companies. They don't, these private companies don't want to be determining what is legal and what is illegal speech. Um, if there is something that is considered illegal speech, uh, it should be a notice and very specific takedown with an appeal that goes to some judicial branch concept. And one idea would be to put together a mini court of regular judges who um, would do this online, so it would be a very quick review but it would give those whose content has been removed an opportunity to protest. In a number of instances, we have seen where um, evidence of atrocities have been taken down because they were considered violent content and very difficult to get back up. And we need to make sure that a free society has access 
to that kind of information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just a very shortly a reaction by uh, Dalia Itzik to what uh, yes, we two heard. Remarks in your and then I give uh, the opportunity for two questions because we really ran out of time. Uh, and then we will uh, Thank you so up much. our panel, please. Two remarks. One of them, uh, Mr. Fisher, uh, Prime Minister Fisher said that uh, media is very influence, uh, influential mean. You know, I, as a politician, I used to think like this, and of course, I dealt with the media, and it's a natural that the, you want that the press will publish good things about you, especially when you try to act well, to, to do uh, good things. Uh, but Netanyahu, in our prime minister, and also Mr. Trump, there are good examples why the, the media is not so influential. Why? Because in, in Israel, the media crushed Netanyahu every day. Even I, as I don't support him, I don't, uh, I don't be, uh, participate in his camp, and I don't support him, and I never vote for him, of course. But you see the results. The more they crush him, the more he's popular. And you see also with Trump, they, I believe that they found ways to bypass the traditional media and they succeeded. Second, average uh, people, they don't believe the media. They used to say, oh, they are exaggerated, I don't believe them. But when it comes to politicians, they believe. Why? Okay, thank you very much. Um, once again, two statements or questions. I see already three or four fingers, so that will be a difficult one. Yes, sir. You hear me? Yes, works. So two constructive critics and one question. I think what the panel is missing is an influencer. I think that we have the youngest billionaire currently. Who is an influencer can change the world much faster than we can change with any agreement we make today. And if this is not going live on Instagram story, then it didn't reach the young people. So include young people more on topics like this and influencers. And my question will be to Ms. Susan. So you've been talking about deepfake and AI. The European Commission has been working for some time on ethic guidelines for uh, trustworthy artificial intelligence. When I hear that, I hear that oh, then uh, also Asia will be working and Russia and US. Are we transforming our global challenges into the virtual world or should there be alternative approach, especially when it comes to AI and ethics of AI? Thank you. Next one, briefly, sir. Yeah. I was surprised I didn't hear the phrase information warfare mentioned once. Can, can you talk a little bit louder, please? I was surprised I didn't hear the phrase information warfare mentioned once. Uh, uh, much of the commentary has to do with what do you do to identify what's wrong, but how do you do some predictive analytics to get ahead of the game so we're not always treading water? Do we need some addition to the Geneva Convention on information warfare? Uh, Peter, Peter Roman, please. Yes, thank you. After listening to all this excellent contribution, um, I feel there is a decisive question. How to make every producer of information accountable? Um, I remember there was a public conversation between uh, President Obama and the uh, sociologist, uh, famous journalist, a lady who was uh, politically very close to Obama. And a, a very nice phrase came out. People tend to believe that the worst thing you have said is the truest one. And on the other side of the aisle, <clears throat> there is a beautiful uh, thought of uh, Raymond Chandler. Art is preventing Science from becoming inhuman. Science is preventing art from becoming ridiculous. So my idea is, what if we have a digital stamp to every producer, apply to every producer for information, like untrue perception, untrue information, or 
punishing, of course, or on the reverse side, praising true perception, true information. Okay, in brief, reactions from this side, uh, Mrs. Ness, you were addressed. Okay, with respect to uh, artificial intelligence and ethics, it is extremely important that these conversations take place not just within one geographic silo, but as a global issue. And some of that is, in fact, uh, taking place, but it needs to be more. Uh, these are horribly complicated and important issues, and the more conversation and discussion uh, that takes place before anything is locked into place is useful. Multi -stake I'm a big fan of multi-stakeholder approaches to addressing some of these issues because um, you do get the influence of a greater geographic dispersion in your outcomes, and that's good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Someone uh, else one wants other, to, yeah, One other point? comment, though, is um, just be careful if you want to regulate everybody or um, in terms of how to make every producer accountable, um, you end up with a ministry of truth, and I don't know that we want to go in that direction. Okay, I think that's uh, uh, food for thought and for another debate. Um, I'm very sorry that we had to hurry up a little bit, but uh, seven excellent panelists uh, within 75 minutes on a subject that would deserve uh, a week of uh, exchange and discussion. So apologies for that, but uh, I would like to uh, invite you to give a round of applause for these seven excellent contributions. And thank you very much. Thank you.